Well, good morning and welcome to worship at Westside. If you're a guest with us today, we want to thank you for choosing to worship with us. Uh, you'll notice in the seat pocket or pew rack in front of you are some guest cards. And if you would take just a moment and fill that out and hand it to one of our ushers as you leave today, it would be greatly appreciated. But we also have a guest reception that is just for you located at the well, which is just across the mall area at the end of today's worship service. Our pastor will be there and he would be honored to meet you. But we also have a gift for you and your family and some light refreshments. Easter is now just two weeks away. It all begins with our extravaganza on Saturday, March 30th at 10 o'clock. There will be graded egg hunts that morning for children up through the fifth grade. Uh, we also are in need of plastic eggs and individually wrapped candy. And that can be dropped off in the mall or in the boxes located in each connection group. Uh, then Easter is the next day, March 31st. We have connection groups at 930 and worship at 1045. Hope you've been busy inviting people to join us for this extra special day each year. That's Easter Sunday here at West Side. Ladies, the Daughters of the King Banquet tickets can be purchased today for $20 right after the service at the Welcome Center in the mall. Uh, the event takes place on April 25th, and Rebecca Fussell is the special speaker that evening. Let me encourage you to get your tickets early as there is a limited supply. Well, finally, it's not too early to be thinking about Vacation Bible School, which takes place June 10th through June 14th. You can go to the church website to both register your children or grandchildren and register to be a volunteer for one of the most exciting weeks annually on our church calendar, and that is VBS. Well, again, thank you for being here today, and now it's time to begin our worship. Good morning, Westside Baptist Church. We're so thankful to see you today, to be with you in worship. As you can tell, there's something exciting happening, and that is today our youth choir is leaving to go on tour. Pastor's going to come in just a minute and pray for our students and for our team that's going. But we're taking 55 people all the way from Jacksonville, all the way to Ohio and back, and we're singing and ministering all along the way. And our choir is going to start off with just a quick song to begin and minister to you today. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? All like life. Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my 
right there this morning. We thank the Lord for them. Um, I want us to take just a moment before we continue in our service to pray for them. Uh, following our service this morning, they will be loading up and heading on a mission trip. Uh, they'll be going uh, from here up through Georgia, uh, into Tennessee, into Kentucky, all the way up to Ohio. And while they're in northern Kentucky, they're going to be spending some time at the Creation Museum and also the Ark Encounter. I'm excited about them going there. And those of you who have been there, I think you would agree with me. That's, that's a great thing. And so, so we want to pray for them. So I'm going to ask you to join me right now. And by the way, just look them over today. Uh, if you know some of them, call their name and, and just pray for them all week long. Uh, if you don't know somebody, just pick out a face and say, that's who I'm praying for all this week. So join me right now in a time of prayer. Father, we do thank you for our young people. Father, these are, um, some of them, there are more than are standing here, but God, we're thankful for each and every one of them. But Lord, these who are going on this trip and the uh, sponsors who are going with them, thank you, Lord, that they're, they want to do this and they're willing to do this. And I pray, God, that you're going to bless them for it. Uh, God, give them safety out there on the highways. We pray that those who will be driving, that they will be alert and they will see things that uh, other people may not see that will keep them safe. And God, I pray that every place they go and where they sing and where they visit and minister to people, uh, God, I just pray that they'll see the love of Jesus in the faces and hear them uh, from the heart of our young people all this week. So God, thank you so much. for Thank you for them blessing us at the beginning of our service here this morning and actually they're a blessing to us each and every week and so lord use them this week and we pray that because of this trip that there'll be folks who'll give their heart to jesus christ so god we look forward to hearing their reports when they get back so watch over them bless them use them we ask it all in jesus name amen give them a hand if you would All right, you guys, head up to the choir loft, join the choir. Church, we're going to continue in singing this next song. It's a song of blessing. It's a song that uh, is just very appropriate as we're sending out the next generation from our church to go and to serve and to sing all across the, the country headed north. Um, it, we just pray a, a song of blessing over them. And so we're going to sing this song today um, that sings a generational prayer of the Lord's provision and the Lord's goodness in our lives. Will you stand with us and sing this together? The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. When you say amen and meet you in agreement, will you sing this with us?
Amen. Ask the Lord to remind you to pray for our students as they go on tour this week, that his favor would be upon us. Maybe you could say, Lord, remind me every morning that I will pray for them as they go. Sing this out. May his favor. Come on. Lift your voices. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. Amen. Church, wonderful singing this morning. Will you continue with us as we sing this next song together? Crown him with many crowns. Let's crown him all the glory that he has deserved. Here we go. Sing it out.
your voices, church, sing his praise. worthy of our praise. We give him the glory this morning. The King of Kings, he's the one that we worship, the one that we sing for. Today, our choir is going to sing one more song for us today, and that is a song called Sound of the Saints. And it says that we march unto Zion, singing with joy and enthusiasm and passion for our Savior. Church, you can be seated, but sing along with us if you like the tune.
What a blessing. Thank you for being here today. I want to ask you to open your Bible to the 23rd chapter of the Gospel of Luke, and I want you to find the 39th verse of Luke chapter 23. I've been talking about the cross of Calvary. Last um, Sunday morning, we went to a hill called Mount Calvary, and today I want to continue kind of going through the ending of Luke chapter 23, and then on Easter Sunday, we will uh, climax our mini-series here in Luke chapter 24. When Jesus died on that dark Friday, he did not die alone. The Bible says there were two others who died with him on the cross, and one was nailed to a cross on his left, and the other was nailed to a cross on his right. Three men died that day. One of them died for sin, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. One of them died in his sin, and that is one that is often called the unrepentant thief. And then one of them died free from sin because he did repent and place his faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus was nailed to the cross, according to Mark's gospel, at the third hour. The third hour would be 9 o'clock in the morning. The Bible says in Luke's gospel that at the sixth hour, that is whenever it was noon, the sun had reached its height in the sky, that there was darkness over the face of the earth. And then Luke also tells us that at the ninth hour that Jesus breathed his last and he gave up the ghost. So he talks about crucified on the third hour, darkness on the sixth hour, death on the ninth hour. And in, in this, they, they didn't have clocks. They didn't look to see what time it was, but they, they measured time by the sun coming up and the sun going down. And so the sun would come up at what we would call about 6 a.m., so the third hour would be 9 o'clock, the sixth hour would be noon, and the, and, and the ninth hour then would be 3 o'clock. And so for six hours, Jesus was nailed to the cross of Calvary. During those six hours, there were some conversations that took place between uh, the two thieves that were on either side of Jesus. Luke is the only gospel writer who tells us this story. Aren't you glad that Luke told us the story, that conversation that took place? Oh, there was a lot of talk going on. Jesus was being mocked by the Roman crowd. He was also being mocked by the religious crowd. They were saying things like, uh, you were going to rebuild the temple in three days. Um, you saved yourself, but you can't, you saved others, but you can't save yourself. So they were, there was mocking going on. And most of that conversation happened between those first three hours on the cross because whenever darkness came at 12 noon, all of a sudden the crowd got quiet. And we'll talk about that next Sunday morning. But most of the conversation took place during the first three hours that Jesus hung on the cross. Luke chapter 23, verse 39. Would you join me in standing as I read our text today? A message that I simply call a stranger in paradise because whenever this sermon is over, you'll understand that there was one who went to paradise with Jesus who the world said was not fit to go. Luke 23, verse 39, And one of the male factors which were, which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. And the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss, or nothing wrong. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today, shalt thou be with me in paradise. What a wonderful passage of Scripture, and I'm so excited to share with you today a message on a stranger in paradise. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Lord, that you moved upon the heart of a man by the name of Luke to record these words for us. 
And Lord, today I pray that you would open them up to us. May we hear what took place, but may we also hear what you want to take place in this room today. So Lord, may our, our ears be attentive, may our hearts be open. God, may we receive what you have to say to us today. And I pray, God, that you would not um, allow any distractions today that would keep us from hearing what you have to say and what you want us to do. This is your time. So please speak, help us to hear. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. You know, one of the interesting things before I get into this text is that not only were, was the crowd at the foot of the cross involved in mocking the Lord Jesus, I said earlier the religious crowd, the Roman crowd, they were all mocking, but the Bible indicates to us that even one thief on one side and one thief on the other side, they joined in the mocking of Jesus on the center cross. Matthew chapter 27 verse 44 reads like this, the thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in their teeth. That means they were saying the same thing that the people down at the foot of the cross were saying as they were mocking Jesus. The two men who were dying, they began to mock him as well. Incredible. But I want to see today what happens in these short verses that I've read to you this morning. I want to talk to you first of all about the railing thief. The Bible describes him in one verse of Scripture. Everything we know about this man is found in one verse of Scripture in verse 39 of my text. And the Bible says it like this, And one of the male factors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. One of the male factors began to speak directly to Jesus and say, if you're the Christ, save yourself and us. Let me say three things about this man. Number one, he is a blameworthy man. And by that, I simply mean this man was guilty. Whenever you read what Luke says, Luke calls him a male factor. If you have a, a different, more modern translation, you may read the word criminal. He was a male factor. He was a criminal. The Greek word is actually a word that means he was an evil worker or he was an evil doer or he was a wrong doer. So this man had done something wrong. So whenever you look at this man, please understand, he has not been mistried. He has not been misconvicted. I, I mean, there's nothing that later coming down the pike that there will be some DNA evidence that come out later and say, no, he was innocent. No, he was a wrongdoer. He was a criminal. He was a male factor. Whenever you read what other gospel writers say, particularly Mark and also, excuse me, Matthew and Mark, they, de they describe him as a thief. They call them thieves. It's a, it's a different Greek word than what Mark uses. It's, it's a word that means to plunder, and actually it means to plunder with violence. So he was a robber. He took things that did not belong to him. And so he was a bad kind of a guy. As a matter of fact, he was a, when the Bible calls him a thief, it's, it's the same word that Jesus used. You remember whenever he came into the temple and the money changers were there and he, and he was talking to them about uh, that they've taken the house of God and turned it into a den of thieves. It's the same word that Matthew and Mark used. It's the same word that Jesus used also when he told us the story of the Good Samaritan when he talks about a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and the Bible says he fell among thieves and he was beaten within an inch of his life and he was robbed. And so it's, it's the same word. This guy was a bad guy. Nobody's coming to his defense. Pilate never looked at him and said, I find no fault in him. This man was blameworthy. The, the judge and the jury got it right. He was a man who was guilty, and therefore he is hanging on a cross because he is blameworthy. A second thing I'll say to you about him, he was also a blasphemous man. Because whenever you read the text there in the King James when it says he was railing on him, he railed on him, the word railed is actually a Greek word that, that is the Greek word blasphemo. 
Sounds like blasphemy, doesn't it? Blasphemo, that gives us the English word blasphemy. And so he is a blasphemous man. One translation says he yelled insults at Jesus Christ. I thought that's a pretty good translation probably because really the word blasphemo or the word blasphemy means to insult that which is sacred. So he was yelling insults at Jesus Christ who is the only begotten Son of God. And so that's exactly what he was doing. He was insulting the Holy Son of God. And by the way, the tense of the language indicates that he just kept on doing it. You hear it? He's relentless. He is irrational. He will not shut up. He just keeps on, and, 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 and he's, re, he's just railing on, blaspheming the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here's one thief on one side of the cross, and the Bible says he's railing at him. And although the Bible indicates in Matthew 27 that both of them had been railing at they had joined in with the crowd, evidently somewhere along the line, probably about right here, somewhere along the line, this other thief, he becomes silent. He becomes contemplative, and he's no longer joining in, but the Bible says this man is railing on him. He is the epitome of godly, godlessness. He is the epitome of somebody who is, has no thought, no regard for God at all. There's no guilt. There's no conviction. There, there's no conscience. There, there's no need of repentance. There's no asking for forgiveness. This man is so anti-God, anti-Christ, that he's, he's yelling insults. He's blaspheming the Lord Jesus Christ. May I just take a moment to say to you, I hate profanity. And I want to say today, I'm tired of it on my television set. I'm tired of it in the world that we live in today. I wish that somewhere along the line today that we could teach modern English and people would learn how to speak without using profanity. And the Bible is saying, this man on the cross, this man on the cross, I think he was yelling profanity at the only begotten Son of God. I say to you today, he's a blameworthy man. I say to you today that he is a blasphemous man. I say a third thing about him, he's also a belligerent man. He's defiant. He's confrontational. He finally turns to the Lord Jesus and he says, if thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. If you're the Christ, save yourself and us. He's like many other men in the world that we live in today. Full of, our, our world is full of men like this. Men who are belligerent, who, who have no fear of God. They have no conviction about God. They have no awe of God. There's no reverence for, reverence for God. They're, 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 they're just living their life for themselves. And unfortunately, they're, they're, they'll be eternally damned to hell because they refuse Jesus Christ as their Savior. So I'm talking to you today about the railing man. He's the railing thief. You see him? He's blameworthy. He's blasphemous. He's belligerent. All the time that he's dying, he's, he's cursing the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the railing thief. Secondly, I want you to notice this. I want you to look at the rebuking thief. Look at verses 40 and 42. We have a little more information about the other thief in our passage of scripture today but look at verses 40 through 42 and i want to i want to say a few things about him now, now before i get into the second guy i want you to hear this he's just as guilty as the first guy they're both male factors they're both criminals they're both thieves he is as worthy of death as the other man is worthy of death but somewhere along the line this one is no longer railing at Jesus this man becomes a rebuking thief because he's rebuking the other thief a few things about him number one he's a perceptive man the Bible says then the other rebuking him the word rebuke is a word which means censor it means to forbid it means to silence uh, the other man over on this side of the cross uh, of Jesus cross was rebuking him it's the same word that is used whenever Jesus, the Bible says, you remember when the storm came up and he rebuked the wind and the sea and so that the wind ceased to blow and the seas calmed down. It's the same word also that is used whenever, whenever Jesus encountered the devil in Matthew chapter 17 and the Bible says he rebuked the devil, he, he censored the devil. 
It's the same word that Jesus used also whenever he came to uh, the house where Peter's mother-in-law was, and she had a fever, and the Bible says Jesus rebuked the fever. And so hey, here's a guy over here. He's been listening to the crowd down there, and he's also been participating for a while with the thief over there, but now he's tired of it. And now he is now rebuking, he is censoring, he's saying to him, please stop, be silence. What, what caused the change? What, what, what causes a man who has been involved in everything that everybody else has been doing, what, what causes a man to suddenly start rebuking him and saying, like, enough is enough, all right? Stop it. What causes him to do that? I'm going to suggest two things. Number one, I think he's been watching Jesus. He's been watching Jesus. I mean, I mean he's been in this whole crucifying process. He too had, had, a, had a cross beam on his shoulders like, like Jesus did. He too walked down the Via Della Rosa like Jesus did. And so, so he's been watching Jesus. And I think if he's watching Jesus, he's watching, he's probably seeing the eyes of Jesus and he's seeing the love in his eyes, the compassion on his face. I think he's been watching Jesus. He's watched Jesus as they, as they got to Mount Calvary. He watched Jesus being nailed to the cross. He's watched all along. I remember whenever the, the movie The Passion of the Christ came out. Y'all remember that movie? And one of the things that struck me on the scene whenever they got to the cross of Calvary and whenever you think about somebody, a thief or a criminal being nailed to the cross and nobody would want to be nailed to a cross, but I remember in that movie it, had, it actually pictured Jesus crawling, getting on the cross. And I thought that's what it is. Jesus voluntarily gave his life, and I think this, this thief, he's been watching him all along. I'm going to suggest the second reason what changed his heart. He had been listening to Jesus as well. He had been listening to what Jesus said. What did Jesus say? Well, the Bible says whenever they were going to the place called Calvary that there were some women who were weeping, and, and, and he and he told the women uh, to, to, to stop their weeping. He spoke gently and kindly to the women as he was on his way to the crucifixion. He heard Jesus as, as he hung on, on the cross, and the first thing that he said from the cross was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I think somewhere along the line, this man was thinking, I've never seen a man like that. I've never heard a man like that. There's something different about this man called Jesus. I think he had been watching, and I think he had been listening to Jesus. I think another thing, I think he'd, been, he'd heard what the crowd said. You know what the crowd said? He saved others, but himself he cannot save. And I think the thing that struck his heart was he, they, they kept saying, he saved others, he saved others, they're stating a fact. He saved others, and somewhere along the line, as he heard them, he saved others, he saved others, that maybe he thought, if he saved others, he can save me. As one old, great old preacher said, that's the only sermon he ever heard came from the lips of the enemies of Jesus when they said he saved others, but himself he cannot save. And so somewhere along the line, this man, oh, uh, he, he was a criminal. And, and yes, and, and, he, and he was guilty. But evidently he wasn't an atheist. Somewhere along the line, there, there was conviction, I think, of the Holy Spirit of God. Somewhere he decided, I'm going to quit the railing as this thief is doing. I'm going to start rebuking. Somewhere along the line, things got a hold of his heart, and there was a change in his life. I think perhaps he realized that the punishment for breaking the laws of man is nothing compared to the punishment for breaking the laws of God. And I don't want that punishment. And so the Bible says he was rebuking him, and this, now, this man knew that something needed to change in his life. Crucifixion is something that is going to take his life, but it's not going to take his existence he knew that whenever this life is over and he breathed this last breath, that he's going to spend eternity somewhere else. And so however it happened, this man on the cross, all of a sudden this man's life began to change. Can I pause and make a preacher point right here? 
Do you know that whenever, whenever I stand here and I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and I invite you to give your heart and your life to Jesus Christ, do you know that as I preach, the same message that you hear is the same message that the person beside you hears, and it's the same message the person in front of you hears, and it's the same message that somebody behind you hears. It's the same message. But here's what happens. Sometimes that message convicts you and brings you to repentance, and it may not convict your friend or your family member and bring them to repentance. Oh, you hear the same sermon. But somewhere along the line, those who are, have been railing all of a sudden become rebuking and even to the point of repenting because they're hearing the same message, but not everybody has the same response. Think about the two things. They've, they've been, both of them have been watching Jesus. Both of them have been listening to Jesus. But one of them is still hurling blasphemies at the Lord Jesus Christ, and the other is now rebuking. Something happened in this man's heart that did not happen in that man's heart. It takes me back to a story years ago whenever I was out visiting on a, on a I don't remember now if it was a Monday night or Tuesday night, but we'd, I'd gone to an apartment complex not far from here. As a matter of fact, I think it was the same one that somebody got shot and killed at a couple of weeks ago. But anyway, I was at this apartment complex. I had a card. I had a name. I had an address. And I went to an apartment complex. It was summertime. It was hot. People were sitting outside of the, of the apartment complex. They were sitting, there was a man sitting in a lawn chair, and he was sitting in front of the apartment. I have, a, I have a name. I have an address. I have an apartment number. And so I go up to the man, and I said to him, I said, excuse me, sir, are you? And I asked him his name, and he said, yes, I am. And I said, well, I've got a card here that says you visited our church not long ago, and I just wanted to come out. I'm, pa I'm Keith Russell. I'm pastor of the church. I want to come out and visit you. He said, I've never been to your church. I said, well, is this your name? He said, yes, sir. I said, is this your address? He said, yes, sir. I said, well, I don't know how, but I've got your name and I've got your address, and so I'm here tonight to talk to you about Jesus. And I, I shared with him the good news of Jesus Christ. And when I got through sharing the gospel with him, I looked at him and I said, sir, is there, would you tonight like to pray and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior? I never will forget it. He looked up at me and he said, no. And I heard a voice behind him that said, I would. While I was talking to that man, a small crowd had gathered around, and I found out later on it was that man's mother who was standing behind him, and she said, I would, and she prayed to receive Jesus Christ as her Savior. I'm saying this today. I can stand here and I can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and ask you to give your heart to Christ, and it may be that somebody sitting next to you says no, but that doesn't mean you can't say yes. So we see that he is a perceptive man. Somehow, thing, God's getting a hold of his heart. And here's how everything changes. Stay with me. Look at verse 41. The Bible says he was a polluted man. What do I mean by that? Well, the Bible says he admitted that he was a sinner. He said to the railing thief, he said, And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. You know what he's saying? I can summarize it in three words. I have sinned. That's what he said. He said, I'm getting exactly what I deserve. By the fact, somebody has said those are the three hardest words in the English vocabulary to say. I have sinned. But the Bible says over in the book of Joshua that Achan came to a time that he said, I have sinned. The Bible says over in the book of 2 Samuel that David came to a time that he said, I have sinned. The Bible says in Luke chapter 15 that the prodigal came to a point in his life when he said, I have sinned sin listen to me very carefully until you get to the point that you can say i have sinned you will never be forgiven your sin and you will never see heaven at all but this man said i have sinned he's not blaming anybody else he takes personal responsibility and he simply says i'm guilty i'm getting exactly what i deserve i have sinned and by the way some of you today need to come to the point in the life that you say I have sinned. By the way, quit blaming mom and dad. Quit blaming the culture. Quit blaming the church. Quit blaming the hypocrites. The truth of the matter is, you are the one who has broken God's law. You are the one who has cursed God's name. You are the one who has rejected God's son. And so the quit blaming it on everybody else and just stand up and say, I have sinned. But not only did he admit that he was a sinner, I said this is how everything changed for him. 
He also admitted that Jesus Christ was the Savior. And then after he said, he, he said, we are being crucified justly. We're getting the due reward of our deeds. And then he looked at Jesus and he said, but this man has done nothing amiss. This man has done nothing wrong. You hear what he's saying? He's saying, I'm a sinner. He's not. What's he saying? I'm a sinner, and he's the Savior. Jesus has done nothing wrong. That's what Pilate said, wasn't it? Jesus said, Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. That's what Paul says later on when he talks about Jesus, that he knew no sin. That's what Peter says also whenever, whenever he comes along, he said there was no, no guile found in him. That is, he was absolutely without sin. Friend, if you will ever get a good look at Jesus Christ, you will also get a good look at yourself, and you will see how far short you fall of being like Jesus. Whenever Isaiah got a good glimpse of him, he said, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. The Bible says, remember over in, John, in Revelation chapter 1, whenever John on the island of Patmos saw a good glimpse of Jesus Christ, the Bible says John fell at his feet as though he was dead. And so we, we, we see that here's a man who's now not only a, a perceptive man, but now we find that he is also a polluted man. But notice this, look at verse 42. He is also a praying man. He began to pray. He began to pray on the cross. I want, to, I want you to notice two things. Number one, I want you to notice who he prayed to. Are you listening? Mary was at the cross, but he didn't pray to Mary. John was at the cross. John the apostle was at the cross, but he didn't pray to John. He prayed to Jesus, the one who made the planets, the one who lit the sun, the one who, who was the only one who could forgive him of his sin. He cried out to Jesus, and he said, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And so I, I want you to know who he prayed to. He prayed to Jesus. Now, what did he pray for? I put it in the outline for you. It, it's real simple. He, it, listen, he, he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Real, real quickly, he called him Lord, recognizing him as the king of the universe. Lord means master. Lord means boss. He was surrendering his heart to Jesus Christ as Lord. He said to him, remember me, requesting that, 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 he, that he would be with him, that he would make him the king of his life. Remember me. It, it, it's personal. May I say to you today, salvation's personal. You can be saved today whether anybody else in the building does or not. It's personal between you and God. He said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom, that is realizing that he has a heavenly kingdom. Now listen, if you have a kingdom, then you must be a king. And so he called on Jesus as being the king. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What, what, a, what a simple statement, right? It's easy to get in contact with God. You don't need an 800 number to call God. And I promise you this, whenever you call him, he won't, he won't send it to voicemail either. And you'll never get a busy signal. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not, God said through his prophet Jeremiah. Just call on him. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, li li listen, you don't have to have a college degree in order to talk to him. Just come to him and share with him what's on your heart. So we see the, the railing thief. This, this is a man who was a, who, who was a blameworthy, blasphemous, belligerent man. And we see this other who is also now, he's the rebuking thief. He's a perceptive man. And he's, he's now, he's, he's praying and, he, and he's asking the Lord to remember him when he comes to his kingdom. One last thing, look at verse 43. Please hang on. Listen carefully. In verse 43, Jesus said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Isn't it good that Jesus stopped dying long enough to answer the prayer of a thief who was praying? Let me say a few things about the reply. Number one, it was an infallible reply. Jesus said, Verily, we we'll stop there. Verily, 
We don't talk like that anymore, do we? Verily, sometimes whenever John records the writings of Jesus, he'll say, verily, verily. What's it mean? It means what I'm about to say is absolutely true. It means truly, truly. It means surely, surely. I heard one preacher said it means show enough, show enough. <laughs> what I'm about to say to you is absolutely true. Verily, it is an infallible reply. Secondly, it's an immediate reply. He said, verily, today, stop right there. Today. That is before the sun goes down. Before this day is over. Today, right here, right now. I want to say this to you today. If you will call out to the Lord Jesus Christ today, your sins can be forgiven. Today, you can have your name written in the Lamb's the Book of Life. Today, you can know that heaven is your home. It is an immediate reply. And then thirdly, it is an intimate reply. Verily, today shalt thou be with me. Jesus says, you're going to be with me. Sometimes people ask me, say, Preacher, where is heaven? And I can give you an, a scholarly, biblical answer if you'd like me to do that, but here's my simple answer. If somebody asks me, where is heaven? Heaven's wherever Jesus is. <laughs> heaven is to be with Jesus Christ. And so he said, today shalt thou be with me. That means he's now been totally reconciled to God. And then number four, it's an incredible reply because he said, today shalt thou be with me where? In paradise. Paradise, paradise being the, the dwelling place of the, of the righteous, the eternal destination of those who are right with God. Today you're going to be with me in paradise. I called this message a stranger in paradise. Why? Because Jesus' last companion on earth was a thief. His first companion in heaven was a thief. Listen to this. The, the Roman government said that this man did not deserve to live on the earth. But Jesus, with one sweeping move of his matchless grace, made him fit to live in heaven, and he wasn't fit to live on earth. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. What an incredible story. Three men dying on three crosses. One dying for sin, one dying forgiven of sin, and one dying still in his sin because he would not trust Christ. Let me close today. I don't, I don't usually do this, but I'm going to close today with, with giving you what I call, there, there, there are six lessons you can learn from these verses. Now, and it won't take me long, all right, so don't, don't sigh. All right, six six lessons learned from these verses of scripture and they're incredible but yet they're very simple six lessons here they, here they are number one is this jesus can save anyone right i mean if he can if he can save a a dying thief a man who was guilty if he can save that man he can die he can save anyone so don't say to me well well pastor i can't be saved uh, because i've done so many bad things oh yes you can you might say to me, Pastor, but you don't know what I've done. It doesn't matter that I don't know what you've done. I know what Christ has done, and Christ has provided a way of salvation. So anyone can be saved. That's listening to this message today. No matter what you've done, you can be saved. Number two, it's never too late to be saved. Here's a man who was about to breathe his last, and he got saved. I think it is the thing I want to, I, life, life is so uncertain. You know, you can be here today and gone tomorrow. But I think that's why we need to be saved now. I think that's why the Bible always says an urgency, be saved today. But whenever you look at this man, it may not be that this was his last chance to be saved, although that's true, but it may have also been his first opportunity to be saved. So I'm saying to you today, don't delay. Don't wait until your last chance. This is your opportunity right here, right now. I think if you were to ask this thief, uh, do you wish you had gotten saved earlier? I think he would have said, I sure do. So that's the second thing. It's, it's never too late to be saved. Number three, 
church ordinances do not say. This man was never baptized. This man never partook of the Lord's Supper. This man never did a lot of things that people say that you have to do in order to get saved, but the Bible says he did not do any of those things, and so church ordinances do not save. Number four, you're not saved by good works. For those of you who think that, oh, whenever I get to heaven, I hope my good works outweigh my bad works so I get to go to heaven, your good works have nothing to do with it. I mean, this particular man, if, he, if that's the way it worked when he got up to heaven, then his bad works certainly outweighed his good works. But so you're, you're, good, you're not saved by your good works. Number five, I'm telling you just some things that you learn from this passage of Scripture. Number five, saved people go immediately to heaven when they die. That's why Paul said, absent from the body is what? Present with the Lord. There is no purgatory. There is no holding place. Whenever you, if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, whenever you've drawn your last breath here, you draw your first breath there in the presence of the Lord. Number six, and this is very obvious, there is life after death. Everybody in this room, we're all going to live somewhere. We're either going to live eternity in, a, in an awful place called hell or a wonderful place called heaven. Everybody's going to live forever somewhere but everlasting life is much better than everlasting death and the only way you have everlasting life is by placing your faith in Jesus Christ and the only one who can do that for you is you I can't do it for you mom and dad can't do it for you nobody can do it for you but you Two men, two different responses. One said no, one said yes. But the reason why Jesus said today you're going to be with me in paradise is because this man took personal responsibility for his sin and he recognized that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world and he himself placed his faith in Jesus Christ. So where you spend eternity is dependent upon you. I close with this story. I hadn't told it in years. I hadn't even thought of it in years, but when I finished this message, God just brought it to my memory, so I want to share it with you today. It's a story about a little boy and an old man. The old man seemed to be the wisest man that this young little boy had ever known. Every question he could answer. He knew everything, and he was just amazed at this man's great wisdom. And then one day he decided, the little boy decided, I'm going to trick the old man. And so this was his plan. He went and caught a little bird, and he put the bird in his hand. And his idea was he was going to let a feather or maybe a wing stick out, and he was going to go up to the old man, and he was going to say to the old man, Old man, what's in my hand? And the old man would see the feather, and the old man would say, Well, it's a bird. And then he would say, Oh man, is this bird living or is this bird dead? And if the old man said, Why, it's living, he was going to just crush the bird, open his hand, and show him that the bird was dead. But if the old man said, Well, that bird's dead, he would just open his hand and let the bird fly away. So he thought he had the perfect plan. He got the bird, he went to the old man, and he said to the old man, he said, old man, what's in my hand? And the old man said, well, it's a bird. And then he said to the old man, he said, is the bird living or is the bird dead? And the old man thought for a minute, and then he said, son, whether the bird is living or dead is in your hand. I thought of that because I want to say today, whether you live or die, it's in your hands. Whether you go to heaven or hell, it's in your hands. And it may be today that you heard the message and the God speaking to your heart, and it may be that the person beside you, behind you, in front of you, maybe it just rolls off of them and it has no response, no, no effect upon them at all. But in your heart, it resonates and you say, I know I'm a sinner and I believe Jesus is the Savior 
And you today can take your eternity into your own hands and say, I'm giving my life to Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me, please? Every head bowed, please, and every eye closed for just a moment. For some in this room today, eternity hangs in the balance right now. You're looking at your own heart. You're looking at your own life. And maybe you're thinking today, I, I, I don't know that heaven is my home. I don't know if that's my destiny. I, I, and you might even be saying, I'm pretty sure it's not. But you know that Jesus is God's son. And you know that you are a sinner. But there's never been a time that you personally have said, Jesus Christ, come into my life and be my Savior. And today can be that day for you. So in the stillness, the silence of this moment, I'm going to ask you all across this room, and those who are watching online or listening by radio, I'm going to ask you today, if you want to be in paradise, if you want to be in heaven with Jesus when all of life is over, and you're ready to give him your heart, your life, your all, would you pray something like this in your heart? Just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. I believe that you are God's son. And I believe you died for my sin. But I also believe you rose from the dead. And right now, I turn from my sin. I ask you to forgive me my sin. Come into my life and be my Savior today. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for hearing my prayer. Now, with your head still bowed and your eyes still closed, in just a moment, we're going to stand. We're going to sing our last song. And I'm going to ask you today, if you prayed that prayer with me just now, I'm going to ask you to slip out from wherever you are when we begin to sing. Come down to this altar. Come take one of our pastors by the hand. There'll be a pastor in every aisle. And just come to them today. And all you have to do is say something like this. I prayed with the pastor. I've asked Jesus to come into my heart. And we'll take it from there. Maybe the day you say, Pastor, I've already done that but yet there's some things in your life that you're not pleased with. Maybe there's some things you need to recommit to. I, whatever that might be, come do that today. Maybe today you say, Pastor, I've done that. I'm a member of this church. But there's just some things that aren't right between you and your Lord. Or maybe you're looking for a church. Maybe you've been visiting here. You come here all the time, but you're not a member here. And you want to make this your church home. Come do that today. Father, we thank you for your presence in this room today. Thank you, Lord, for the way you speak to us through your word. Thank you again that Luke wrote down this story that took place on Mount Calvary so that we could hear it and be blessed by it today. Use it, please, to speak to our hearts today. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand me, please? While we sing, there's something God wants you to do. You want to just come and pray. Come to it right now while we sing. Just as I am.
we're not going to wait a long time. But I want to say to you today, everybody in this building, you've all heard the same songs, you've all heard the same sermons, but not everybody responds the same way. I think that's the message we hear today. Some might be the unrepentant thief and just say, no, I don't, I don't want Jesus. You're the Christ, save yourself and us. Just a physical salvation was all he's after. But others, you might say, no, I heard that same message. But I want to be like the repentant thief. I want to say, Lord, remember me. And so today, forget about everybody else. And however they might respond, how are you going to respond? Because that's what makes a difference in eternity. And you have to come to the place in your life where you say, it doesn't matter what anybody else does. I'm giving my heart to Christ. And I also want to say to you today, now some of you just a moment ago, you may have prayed with me in your heart and asked the Lord to come in your heart. That's a wonderful thing. But I'm going to tell you, Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But he said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. There's something good about taking your public stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't let the devil cheat you out of a blessing. Just say today, I'm going to come. I, I, I'm not ashamed of Christ. I want the whole world to know that I've given my life to him. So do that today. So we're going to sing just another verse or two. And while we sing, there's something God wants you to do. I want, you to, I want to ask you to bow your head. Close your eyes. Would you just spend a moment and pray? Pray for the person on your left. Pray for the person on your right. You may know them. You may not know them. And you, whoever they are, you certainly don't know their heart, no matter how well you know them. So may this be the day that you pray for somebody who needs to give their heart to Christ, that they come do it today. So right now, let's sing another verse. And while they sing and while you pray, I pray that all of us will say yes to Jesus who said yes to the cross. You come right now. I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I Would you please be seated right now? We want to introduce some who are in a moment who are coming to make decisions for the Lord. But before we do that, just a few quick things before you go. Uh, if you are a guest with us, we are so delighted that you've come to be at Westside with us today. And you are invited to the pastor's guest reception, which is immediately following our closing song. You can go out any of these exit doors across the mall. You'll find the well. And if you'll come to the well for just a few minutes, we have some refreshments for you, a small gift for you. Love to get to know you a little bit better. Also, we want to remind our young people of the youth service that will begin tonight at 6 o'clock in the Family Life Center. And also just to remind you, as you heard earlier, Easter is coming. Two weeks from today is going to be Easter Sunday. We have, I have one more time ordered some of these yard signs. We have a few of them and when they're gone today, they're gone, okay? So we want you to get some or get one to put in your uh, yard so that people can see and want to come and be with us here at Westside. Also, when you go out to the mall area, we have some cards. Um, well, I have some. Yeah, there they are. We have some cards like this advertised. It looks just like the sign. 
this is probably better than the sign. We have stacks of these. They all need to be gone. So when you pick up a yard sign, or even if you don't get a yard sign, pick up a stack of these and invite your neighbors, your friends, wherever you are, invite them to come and be with us on Easter Sunday. So please do that. And again, as you already heard, ladies, the daughters of the King Banquet is coming up April the 25th, and you need to purchase tickets for that. Let me say one other thing, and that is thank you for the way that you financially support Westside Baptist Church. God has blessed us by your giving. And so I want to encourage you to continue to give, and, and uh, you can give online, you can give to an usher on your way out, you can put it, your offering in a drop box, many different ways to give. But I want to encourage you to continue to be faithful uh, in serving the Lord through giving. God bless you for coming today. Brother Rick. Thank you, Brother Keith. We have a couple of decisions we want to celebrate today. Allow me to introduce Leslie Ellison. She's coming today to rededicate her life to Christ. And we're thankful for that decision. Also coming today is Ethan Brady. He is coming today. He gave his heart to Christ about three years ago, making that public today, desires to be baptized. And if you all would follow Brother Bob to the counseling room, we'd appreciate that. Thank you for being here today. Let's all stand. We'll have our closing song. Amen, church. We're going to sing this chorus with you. Whoa, sing hallelujah. Whoa, whoa, we sing hallelujah. Church, pray for our youth choir as they go on tour. You're dismissed.